I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Today, I'm going to be responding just to something that I'm thinking, not to one of Russell Brand's uh, interviews, and I'm calling this From FOMO to JOMO, The Joy of Missing Out. I don't know if I'm the only one feeling this way, but I am missing my time alone. All of a sudden, things are open again, and there are 12 different things that are competing for my attention. There are places that I should be going, and there's people that I should be seeing, and all of a sudden, we have an opportunity to go out, and who knows how long it's going to last. So it feels like that should be what I'm doing, but I don't want to. I want to stay home and uh, knit or read or uh, make soup um, or just spend time by myself, just waste time. That idea that we had in the middle of the pandemic, which of course, we're still in the middle of, that all we needed to do was survive it. All we needed to do was take care of ourselves, protect our sanity. We did a lot of caring for the soft, hungry body. We looked at ways that we could feel better, that we could protect our mental health, and at the same time, try to keep our physical health going, which was a challenge. And now we're thrown back into the way that things were with the idea that there are these restrictions, but these restrictions give us even less permission to take care of ourselves. at least psychologically they do. And so it may also be winter, and the idea that the, you know, we've just gone through the time change here in the U.S. And so my impulse is getting higgy with it. <laughs> and yes, I know that's not how that Danish term is pronounced. That uh, is the idea of coziness. But uh, my daughter and I, we decided to have a COVID night uh, on Tuesdays. So we made hot chocolate, we played board games, we went for a long walk, and we just pretended that we weren't allowed to go anywhere else. I think that a jigsaw puzzle could be the next step, but that's way too much of a commitment for the way that things are right now. So I want to talk about how I think we should be looking at time. Can we waste time? And look at that from a spiritual perspective. If you followed some of my playlists like Mind Out, Out Over Matter or Time Out of Mind, you know that I think that this world is potentially something that we are dreaming up. And that time is a gift in order to give us the opportunity to come back into our right mind. And so an analogy I use is that we're like a hamster in a wheel. And the busier we are, the faster time flies because we're making it go in those loops. When we meditate, for instance, I think what we're doing is slowing down and that we are stepping aside from that hamster wheel and getting in touch with eternity, with that spaciousness, with that timelessness. And so I think that time is elastic. I think that it uh, is not a set thing. I don't think it's possible to waste time because time belongs to you. It's really the only thing that belongs to you. And as much as there is huh, more of a concerted effort, I feel, to take that time and make it not your own these days, I think you should claim it. And so there's a, a coffee shop that has a big sign that is around the corner from me that says, relax, you have plenty of time. And every time I drive past it, I just breathe a little more deeply. 
and something in my body just relaxes. So I think we should be keeping that concept. I also want to speak in defense of reading. I don't know about you, but I, I have this idea that when I'm reading, I'm wasting time that it's a luxury, it's an indulgence, it's something that I'm doing when I should be active, where I'm just being passive. And in my last episode, Six Levels of Reality, I quote from John Taylor Gatto on education. And last night I was reading this piece that he wrote about reading and how reading used to be in the United States when it was a newborn country and, uh, and everyone read. Once upon a time, he writes, we were a new nation that allowed ordinary citizens to learn how to read well and encourage them to read anything they thought would be useful. Close reading of tough-minded writing is still the best, cheapest, and quickest method known for learning to think for yourself. This invitation to commoners extended by America was the most revolutionary pedagogy of all. Reading teaches nothing more important than the state of mind in which you find yourself absolutely alone with the thoughts of another mind, a matchless form of intimate rapport available only to those with the ability to block out distraction and concentrate. Hence the urgency of reading well if you read for power. Once you trust yourself to go mind to mind with great intellects, artists, scientists, warriors, and philosophers, you are finally free. In America, before we had forced schooling, an astonishing range of unlikely people knew reading was like Samson's locks, something that could help make them formidable that could teach them their rights and how to defend those rights, could lead them towards self-determination, free from intimidation by experts. These same unlikely people knew that the power bestowed through reading could give them insight into the ways of the human heart, so they would not be cheated or fooled so easily, and that it could provide an inexhaustible store of useful knowledge advice on how to do just about anything. And the idea of thinking clearly has never been, I think, more important. Maybe that's a conceit of, of the age, but I, a lot of what I feel pulled to do, part of it is social, but part of it is also political. There are a lot of movements that are happening that I agree with. I agree with those who are looking at the danger of vaccine mandates, for instance, and vaccine passports, and standing at the farmer's market and gathering signatures is something that I feel I should be doing. And at the same time, I feel like we are dealing with a runaway train and that We can throw our bodies in front of that train, but it's not going to stop it. And I'm not sure we should stop it, that I think we are this fulcrum on which things are tipping. And that maybe having that fulcrum be round and trusting that the fall is actually going to be a good thing for us. I think that might be a good thing to do. But at the same time, I know that I am, if not a credible person in my community, at least a lovable crackpot. And so being that face to be associated with views that for many people, they are just completely unexposed to unless it's in association with a person with whom they disagree on many other ideologies. I do think that's also important for me. So I don't, I don't know which way I'm going to go on that. Um, so what can, useful advice can I give you on this? <laughs> Some of it is the art of the good excuse. When you are wanting the joy of missing out, how do you say no? 
one option is to be honest. And I have found that to be pretty effective. I found that other people have responded in a way where they say, yes, you know, I'm feeling the same way. And I really am happy that you told me that. And the other is, you know, that the, 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 uh, the easier lie, you know, that you can always plead weakness these days. And you can say, I just don't know that I'm ready for it. There was something about having this isolation that has made me socially hesitant. And maybe that's not entirely true, but these days you can get away with saying that and people will give you the space that you want. So those are my advice, my pieces of advice. And I'm going to end looking at one purpose. What is our purpose right now? I think that our number one purpose is to think clearly. And so going into our own process of self-exploration and self-exploration is something that is always available to you. That is, I believe, the most important thing that we can do. I think also that this is a time to imagine what could be in the full knowledge of what is. So take the time to start picturing what it is that you want to have come out of all this. And then third, I'd say, live the life that you want everyone to have. If you have the opportunity, be a model for what you want to give to everyone in terms of that life that is sustainable for all of us. At one point, I was part of a, uh, a monastery where I was an oblate, which is a lay monk. And it's someone who goes through a year of, uh, of, of, of meditation and of being in the world, but also being part of that. And one of the things I wrote was 96 Habits of a Hopeful Oblate. You can find it with a little research on my old radio show website, which is thirdparadigm.org, and it's under Other Writing. So in that, one of the things I said was, let your house become hungry and dance with joy at your return from the grocery store. I think that letting our selves be a little hungry for communication, for other people, for real um, encounters. I think that's a good thing to not clutter ourselves too much, both with stuff, with food, with uh, maybe with stimulation and ideas, and just leave some space so that what is in you can emerge. So I hope that that might be helpful for others if they're feeling this way. And if you like this, here's another video in the same vein. And here's a playlist along the same lines. And I would love it if you would subscribe. Thank you.